We're on page 1200. There's just something about Sunday that you didn't have church coffee to make it feel complete. Any questions about things before we get started? Dive in. Okay. That's fine. We have some review built into today because um, it's been a while since we've had Bible study. We'll do that now. Justin, you've never been here before. It's because you happen to live 400 miles away. There's no excuse not coming to Bible study on Sunday. Well, you just said miles away. Yeah, yeah, what she said. <laughs> I watched her when she showed my Uh-huh, sure. He's my brother, in case you're wondering on the internet. My brother is here. My older brother, and my taller brother, and my more bearded brother. Yeah, anyway, so we're in Romans 8. Um, let's take a look at this study here. We'll start on the front page, which is a good place to start. So, it's been some time since we've met. Um, I think a brief review is in order. So, so far, we've been taking a look at Paul's his argument in Romans, right? It's a reminder um, that the chapters and verse divisions, they were put in by French monks a long time after the Bible was written. Um, and so while they can be helpful in some ways, like if you want to say go to Romans chapter 12 to talk about a small section, that's great. But other times they kind of break up the Bible. Um, it's, it's meant to be read in, in larger portions at a time than just a chapter. Um, and the book of Romans is a, as we talked about before, a very particular style of historic literature called the diatribe. Um, Seneca used it, and that other guy used it. Um, you know what I'm talking about? The orator. Anyway, um, and so it, he's a, and so this is it follows the same kind of style as used and is documented throughout the rest of ancient literature, right? Um, and so we're going to take a look at this um, through the whole thing, and it's just one argument Paul's making about living life as a Christian, right? So the first section deals with everybody's a bunch of worthless sinners. Um, the second session um, deals with okay. You're a sinner, but Jesus loves you and forgives you and saves you, which is a super, super important part. Then chapter 7 talks about how do we balance this life of being a, a sinner and a saint at the same time. Um, and where, um, so chapter 7, verse 4, verse, uh, verse 16, now, I, if I, um, verse 15, sorry. For I don't understand my own actions, for I don't do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I don't want to do. Now, if I do what I don't want, I agree with the law that it's good. It's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. Um, now, I, now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law, then, that when I want to do good, the evil lies close at hand. For in my inner... And my delight is the law of God and my inner being, but my members of war is raging against me. The law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. All right, so you have this, this duality here that, you know, the Apostle Paul's talking, yeah, I'm a saved person. I'm, you know, the Apostle Paul. And even I struggle with sin. And so we see this play out. And then the rest of Romans, where we're going to start moving on to today and going us forward, is going to talk about what's called sanctification. It's the big fancy word again. If you want to sound smart, you say it in Latin. Sanctification is a Latin word. Uh, I have a whiteboard. Don't give me weird looks. So we have S A N C T E F Y. Sanctification. Might be the joke. What do you call a magician who has no magic? Sanctify comes from the Latin word sancti, which we translate as holy. And holyification sounds way less awesome than 
sanctification. You want to sound smart? You say man, because sanctification sounds way better than holyification. But it means the same thing, right? So sanctification is the process by which we're continuing to be made holy. And so the Holy Spirit, after, we're, after we've been baptized, after we've been saved, after we've come to faith, works inside of us, and now we have this war, which Paul was talking about in chapter 7, where we want to do good things, but we can't. Um, and we fight against each other, and our insides are always in struggling, they're, they're sinning, they're not sinning. Uh, and that's because of this, the holyification process, or the sanctification process, where the Holy Spirit is inside of us making us into new people, um, where we try to do more and more and more right. Now, not to save us, because we're already saved, but because we want to live a life that's God's pleasing. And so starting in Romans 8, he's going to start to explore this topic of sanctification, which will last through the rest of the book. And it's going to answer the question, so you're a Christian, now what? And we're going to explore that through the rest of, rest of Romans here. Okay? Any questions about my, my Latining? My holyificationing? <laughs> Um, side note then, this is probably important to talk about. What does what does holy mean? And if you say with a hole, you got to with this. Justin. <laughs> no, seriously though, what does holy mean? We say holy a lot in the church. Like a lot. We had a whole song about it today for our last hymn was holy, holy, holy. What does holy mean? Blessed? Good thought. What else? That's tight. Set apart. What do you mean by set apart? Okay, well, you're kind of right. Uh, you're both pretty right um, for what it is. Um, the word holy means set apart for service to God. Or it means blessed. sets it apart. Right. So you're both right there. Um, so set apart for service to God. This would be the definition of using holy when it applies to people. Right. Uh, and so like in the church we have a lot of holy things. So many bad puns that I can make with that. Um, <laughs> like donuts. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so like up front in the church, for all the stuff that we use for our services, like the uh, the candle stands, uh, or the communion wear, or the acolyte robe, baptismal or the, font. the baptismal font. Those are all holy things, because we have set them apart for service to God, uh, and so they are only used in in holy senses and, and set apart for service to God kind of senses. Um, and so when people make something holy, we make it holy to set apart for service to God, right? Um, and another way of looking at holy is this definition of blessed, uh, in the sense that God has set it apart. So when we say that God is holy, what we mean by that is God is set apart from everything else. He's on his own category, his own, you know, God tier level, if you will. Of yeah, yeah. Uh, set apart from everything else, distinct would be another another way you could say it. 
Um, and so then God sometimes chooses to make people holy. And God chooses to set them apart. Right? God chooses to bless them, to, to set them apart and make them holy. So like the nation of Israel is God's holy nation. Because God has set them apart from the rest of the world. We, being the new Israel, because of, through baptism, are set apart from the rest of the world. Um, so we're holy um, in, in that sense. We being Christians, not, not Americans. I mean, just three of us. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Nobody else. No, yeah, just Christians. Um, and as, as Paul talks about in Galatians, um, the baptism is a new circumcision. Um, and it talks about in the book of Acts, and even here in Romans for a bit. Um, we learned that when the marker of God's people isn't genealogy, it's faith. Right? Jesus mentions it on Palm Sunday when he walks into Jerusalem. He's like, out of these rocks I can make children of Abraham. Right? It's not about your bloodlines, it's about who you trust. The book of Hebrews explores this quite a bit too. And so you are a holy people who are set apart for your service to God. Okay, so, Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? Oh, goodness. Is that a part of God set apart? <laughs> yeah, it's a part of God set apart. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the, 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 the Holy Spirit is called, uh, if you want to say it in smart, you say it in Greek, the paraclete, uh, which is the, the helper. Paraclete. Not parakeet, that would be a bird. Paraclete, from parakaleo, which is the Greek word for uh, comforter or helper. Uh, and so he's a wonderful, he's, he's our, he is our helper. Um, and the Holy Spirit is God's spirit who sets us apart. Um, he is distinct from God, um, as is seen throughout all the scripture. Um, yeah, good stuff. Okay. Holy cow would be a different one. <laughs> I'm sorry. My brother is here and I'm making jokes. I, I suspect that's why. <laughs> <laughs> We've been brothers my whole life, and it makes a difference. So let's read the Bible and move on with our Bible study. Um, let's read verses 1 through 8. It's that first paragraph. Would one of you mind reading that out loud for us, please? There is therefore now no con condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. Uh, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind of the spirit is life and peace. For the mind is that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, uh, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Thank you. So, why is there now no condemnation for those who are in Christ? Yeah, because we've been saved. We're in Christ. It's, 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 you're no longer outside of Christ, what condemnation is. You are in Christ. Then the harder question, what does it mean to have a mind that lives according to the sinful nature? Do the right thing. 
Yeah. A mind that lives according to sinful nature is a mind that doesn't struggle with sin. All right. So in chapter 7, we had this whole discussion about this, this fight that Paul says, this war inside between the mind who wants to do the right thing and the body who wants to do the wrong thing. Um, it's now he's describing about a mind that wants to do the wrong thing, that lives according to sinful nature. And so he's saying that there is a problem um, if you don't struggle with sin. Right, because if you don't struggle with sin, that means that you are now agreeing that sin is okay. Now, that's not to say that everybody is going to be constantly beat down by guilt and shame over all of their sins at all times, or that you're even going to know what your sins are. That's, that's not what this is saying. Um, but what it is saying is that as a Christian, we live a life of repentance, um, that we recognize our sinfulness, and we are always trying to repent of it. Even in those moments where we're like, you know what? I don't think I sinned today. Uh, we could say things like, that thought is probably sinful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for not recognizing my sinfulness because I probably did sin today. Um, and so we're trying to, to train our minds um, to not think um, on the things that are down here, but on the things above. To recognize our sinfulness, to recognize the gospel that we have, the law, the law of the gospel we have in God. Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? We're ready to move on. No flags on the play, we're moving on. All right. Let's read the next couple paragraphs here, verses 9 through 17. Um, yeah, for it. Yeah. Great. Do you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit? If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised uh, Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are, not, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the spirit, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Great. Thank you. So what does it mean for your body to be dead to sin? It means that your bodies are going to die, right? Your body that you have now is not the body you're going to have forever. Your body is dead in sin. You need a new body, this is what we believe. The resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. Right? The last two lines of our creeds. In some semblance it will. Like we would say, oh yeah, it's Sue. I don't know who you are. Um, how old you will be. To be six, 16, 26, 106, 606, nobody knows. Um, but we do not be able to tell who you are. Um, so that would be nice. But no, our bodies are dead to sin in that our bodies bring about our own death, um, spiritual death because our bodies lead us to sin, and physical death because our bodies. It's a vessel. Yeah. I see what you're saying. But I'm lost. Mm, no. <sighs> the Holy Spirit lives within us. You, you, no, you're right. You're right in what you're saying, um, but the danger of what you're saying is it can cause us to not um, to see ourselves as like ethereal spirits. Right, that we're just kind of like um, a ghost that's taken possession of a body. And that's really not the way that it works. Good, that's not the way that it works. 
That's the way the Mormons teach it, and it's wrong. I'm not uh, Mormon. That's, that's good. I promise. <laughs> uh, but it is a it is a common a common thought in Christianity that the purpose of of Christianity is to help you escape the body, right? And so we'll take this time to talk about why that's wrong uh, with another one. Because I have a whiteboard, and I'm going to use it. Can't tell me no. There's two words that we have to talk about. The first is Gnostic. This is, this is something to be aware of, and it's a good place to talk about it. Uh, because if, when you watch like TV during the times of the holidays, and they talk about how one Christianity won over the other kinds of Christianity. I'm not sure if you've heard that phrase before. And it's all Constantine's fault. It's another phrase that I've heard before. Um, and it has to do with this, Gnostics and Gnosticism, which was a heresy in the early church that denied a lot of things about Christianity that just aren't, you know, that they're wrong about. The Gnosticism teaches that when Jesus came to earth, he gave his disciples secret knowledge um, to help them have their souls escape their bodies. And so the goal of, of Christianity then is for soul freedom. Not the word that they use, but that's, that's what it is. It comes from a very Greek philosophical thought of duality, which is your body and your soul are separate. They're two distinct things. Um, and that's a very Western way of thinking about it and a very Greek way of thinking about it, but not necessarily the way the Bible talks about it. Um, and it's challenging, and it's a very, uh, we could have a whole Bible study just talking about the duality of the body and spirit. Um, and so an important question to wrestle with is this, do you have a soul or are you a soul? Wow. Yeah. And so I'll lean towards the second option. And then I say that what's the, what's the tragedy of death, right? The tragedy of death is that it rips apart the body and the soul. And so you're no longer a complete person. You don't have a body in heaven. You get a body in the new creation when God remakes the heavens and the earth. Ah, okay. So in Revelation, um, it talks about how the souls of the saints of God are gathered around his altar. Well, waiting. I remember that. Waiting, yep. And then like, how long, will Lord, do we get our bodies back? Like, they're really excited. They're in heaven, literal heaven. But they realize that it gets better than that. Right? The new creation is going to be better. And so we have to be careful, and this is probably just me because sit around and think for a lot of my days. Um, that we don't, we want to talk about the difference between our body and our soul um, without falling into this. Um, so you got to watch the pendulum again. You can't go too far one way, you can't go too far the other. you got to find that, that happy medium of I am a soul um, and how that works out. And so when Paul here says, how can you be dead to sin and alive to Christ at the same time? My body's going to die, my soul's going to continue. I'm going to die, I'm going to continue. And it's a paradox um, that we have to experience. One that we're comfortable with because we hear it all the time, because this is the language of Christianity, because it's in the Bible. <laughs> but it's, it is one of those, those mysteries that we experience, that in my sins I am dead, and I am going to die one day. But at the same time, I'm already saved, because I'm currently united with Jesus, and so I'm going to live. Um, at the same time, I'm going to die and not die, and it's just going to be a, this, this paradox that we experience in our, in our faith. Um, I've, I've long said if you're not comfortable with paradoxes, Christianity is going to be hard for you, uh, and, and it is. <coughs> Another way to look at it <coughs> is the chapter seven, 7 part, where the, the Apostle Paul makes this distinction, uh, where he says that it's this, this fight within me, um, between my sinfulness 
and my renewed spirit my re that, that's been saved, the body that's going to die and my soul that lingers on until I get a new body. Um, and that fight is going to continue. Um, yeah. Any questions, thoughts about that? I don't want to keep beating the dead horse. If you guys understand what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get you. Okay. So verse 12, Paul mentions an obligation. Right? We are debtors. What's the debt? We owe Jesus. He paid our price. Right? So now we're debtors to Christ. He paid the price of sin. We've been set free from sin. Um, so, this is a, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Um, we're not to be debtors to the flesh. Right? So we don't try to do the things of the flesh, but try to do the things of the Spirit, because Jesus bought us. Right, so the things of the flesh are the sinful things, and so we try to like not do sinful things <laughs> because we've been purchased by Jesus. And so we try to do the things that God wants us to do. Uh, not because it saves us, but because we're already saved. Um, this, is the, this is called the third use of the law. So the law of God three uses. Curb, mirror, and guide. Flash map. Flash TV. Okay, one time soon. Sword. We'll talk about this So what, what does the law do? It does one of three things. So it curbs our actions, usually with a sword. Uh, this would be like the government kind of laws. If you're going to go 139,000 miles an hour on the interstate, you're probably going to get a speeding ticket. Take away your license. I hate going that fast. And accuse you of breaking the laws of physics. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, but the sword is there to prevent you from doing wrong. If you're out of bank, you're going to jail. That's how it works out. Um, the mirror, this is the one that we focus on the most in church. So all of our, most of my sermons talk about the second use of the law, which is stop being a sinner. Like today we talk about a specific law in church today. And if you're watching this in confirmation class, I'm giving you answers for your sermon report. Uh, today we specifically talk about how uh, we are enemies to God and that our own selfishness will sometimes prevent us from following God's will. We talk about that today. That's looking at the mirror and saying, oh yeah, I'm selfish. Probably shouldn't do that anymore. That's the second use of the law. And the third uh, is this guide map GPS. This is what he's talking about now. This is the whole unification part. So now we have these laws of God. So, right, so we have the Ten Commandments. Why do we follow the Ten Commandments? Yeah, because it's a law. Because of this. It shows us how to live lives as, as Christians in the way that God wants us to do. Not to save us, that's, that's a done deal, taken care of, Jesus paid for that. Um, but it tells us how God wants us to live our lives. And that's why we follow the Ten Commandments. Okay. Okay. Um, how do we become God's children? Baptism. Perfect. What implications are there um, for us if we're God's children? Well, we become heirs, right? That's what he says here. You get an inheritance. How do you get an inheritance? So he dies. <laughs> right? And so Jesus died. What do we get? Yeah. Inheritance. Part of the family. Great. All right. Let's read this next section here. I think it's my turn. I don't know why it's up at verse 27. I'm going to go all the way to 30. No, I'm not. I'm going to go to 27. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, my questions get weird. 
18 to 27. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For you know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we eagerly await the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we're saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But we hope what we don't see, and we wait with it for patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we offer the Spirit intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. And he who searches hearts because knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Great. What sufferings is Paul talking about? Verse 18. Yeah. Life. Life. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. 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 Yep. All of it. Every instance of from the smallest stubbed toe to the worst atrocity. All of these sufferings aren't even worth mentioning compared to how great heaven's going to be. Which is in itself a pretty big statement for how great heaven's going to be. And then it gets better than heaven. Okay. Which is what he goes on to talk about next. So what, what what's what's verse nineteen mean? Creation wants Jesus to come back too. When are the sons of God going to be revealed? On the last day, when God gathers them up together and everyone's there. Creation is ready for the last day to happen too. We've talked about this in Bible study like a lot that creation itself has been corrupted, right? The sin out there the sin is out there. And it's not just like a place filled with sin, but the stuff is sinful, corrupted. That grass that's buried under that snow, it's corrupted grass. That snow on top of the grass is corrupted snow. This camera is a corrupted camera. It's all corrupted by sin. And it's all waiting to no longer be corrupted. When was it all corrupted by sin? At the fall, when God cursed it, right? And God said, Cursed be the ground because of you, was the word that God spoke. And so all of creation has been cursed because of sin. How will creation be liberated? Verse 21, right? To be set free from its bondage. When's this going to happen? Second coming of the earth. Perfect. How does being turned over to the children of God liberate creation? Because God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. It's the same answer here. Paul's just saying it in different ways. Um, that way we get this all going on here. Uh, okay. So what does Paul say about prayer in verse 26? What do you say here? The Holy Spirit translate our prayers into super duper heavenly talk. Groanings too deep for words. Right? And I like to think of it like this, right? So we've already established that we're God's children. Yes? Yes. God's our Father. Yes. Yes. Have you seen a small child before? Like a, like a three-year-old? Have, three ex- have, four four <laughs> have you ever experienced a two-year-old or a three-year-old come and try to tell you about their day? Oh, yeah. It's like you're speaking to me. I'm almost sure of it. Right? They're there, and they're just standing there looking up at you, just blabbing on about something, and words are kind of coming out sometimes. Right? That's us talking to God. Right? Does, does a parent know what that kid needs? Always. Yes. A parent can take care of that kid? You bet. Does a kid have any idea? Does a parent have any idea what that kid's saying? No. Most likely not. So God's got this extra feature built in, which is the Holy Spirit, that translated three-year-old toddler talk <laughs> into grown-up talk. And then, this is what the intercession is. 
And so sometimes, like, if you have a family come over, like, I don't know, a brother, and he comes and plays with kids, it's like, what did he just say? And you can explain it. Um, explain what it is. Yeah, I had a young guy this morning, and he was really trying to tell me about his truck. And, like, I was looking around, it's like, you're not there, Ashley's not there. It's like, <laughs> Yeah. Then we set our head on backwards. <laughs> yeah. So um, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, and so He takes our words um, and brings them before God, um, not just in the fun, silly way of, of you know Thomas or whatever, but even when we don't know what words to say to God, um, the Holy Spirit knows what our needs are because He's God and gets to be right, and will take our prayers to God for us, right, and say all of the things that we should have said. And so we do our best in prayers, and we pray for the things that we need, and God commands us to pray. This is one of those, these things. God commands us to pray, and so we do. Um, and then the Holy Spirit takes those prayers, and then presents it in the way that God wants to present it. Like, this is what you should have said. And then, and then says it to God for us. But often without words. It even just, the groanings too deep for words just captures the raw emotion that we experience. So all of our emotions are also included in that. From... Um, all the sad times of the um, loneliness and bitterness and emptiness and depression and anxiety and those kinds of deep feelings, all of the happy emotions of joy and jubilation and elation and all those other Asians, they're all there. And it's all captured and then presented to God by the Holy Spirit for us. When people say, you know, I don't know how to pray, I don't know what to say to God, Holy Spirit. Yep. yep. Specifically these words. Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Right? It is a weakness of human creatures to not know what to say. And that's okay. God's already helping out with that. He had a plan in place. He makes it work out. God knows what you need before you ask. Because he's God. He should know that. It's part of his job. And he'll take it all and translate it and make it right. He just asks here, again, third use, that we do pray. Okay. All right, let's read 20 to the end of the chapter. Justin, thank you for volunteering. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, but for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Would you stick to the end of the chapter? Yep. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not but also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ is the one who died, but more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or prosecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? That's a good new topic. So, verse 28 is like one of my pet peeves. <laughs> How has it been abused by our culture today? heard this phrase before, right? God works together all things for good. Mm -hmm. Right? And oh, everybody seems to think that what they're doing is Yeah? Um, they're doing it in the name of God. And they think it's good. And it isn't always. Have you ever heard this phrase said at a very sad time? Like in a hospital room? Or at a funeral? Something like that. Somebody gets a cancer diagnosis. God works together all things for good. Heard that before? 
so many dies. God works together, all things for good. Heard that before? Yeah? After a disaster, yep. After a tornado or something. Yeah. Is that what this passage is saying? What good is God working towards? Salvation of souls. That's the good that God wants. Right? So God will work together everything in order to save people and to save their souls. This is what all of Romans is about. Romans is about salvation. Romans is about, and so the good that God's working towards is saving people from their sins. And so God can even use the most horrific of events for good. For what good? To save people from their sins. But is that good necessarily your good? No. <laughs> right? God can take something bad happening to you and use it for somebody else's benefit. And we told that story about the hospital. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's that stuck with me. So, Madam Vickers, uh, my my supervising pastor, told me the story. I'm about this verse. Uh, when he was going to a nursing home, he had a member of the church who had uh, fallen and, and broken their whatever arm or leg or something like that, and they were in the in the recovery in the. Uh, in a nursing home. They were elderly, they couldn't do surgery because they were too old, it was just kind of a wait until it heals as best as it can, kind of thing. And this person was um, really distraught about it. Like, why would this happen to me? I've been faithful my whole life. You know, I go to church every week, I always go to Bible study and the whole thing. Um, and, you know, as a pastor, you don't know the answers to that question. Why, why do bad things happen to good people? It's not a, a satisfying answer. There are answers to it not satisfying answers to it. Um, so Pastor's going there and he's just talking about Jesus. And he goes and he sees this person time and time again and have conversations and always talk about Jesus. And he starts to notice that when he's there, there is a person who is uh, always, always by the door when he's talking. Um, a different resident in, the, in their wheelchair. It's always, always there by the door. Um, comes by time and time again kind of lingers and pastor goes to after a few weeks of this goes and talks hey I've noticed that every time I'm here you like to linger by my door uh, can I help you <laughs> what's going on um, and this person had never heard about Jesus before um, and pastor was able to go and to talk to her and, and, and share the gospel this person was baptized and then a few weeks later died um, and is now in paradise right and so in the, in the song today that we sang our, our hymn, some are called in morning, some are called in evening. This person was called in, called in the evening to glory. And so God took an event, a horrible event, of a faithful Christian getting seriously hurt, will be in pain the rest of their lives, uh, never recover from it. And he used it for good, or he brought about salvation for somebody else. Um, that kind of thing. God works together all things for good, for those who are called to his purpose. So this purpose was called to bring another person to faith. Cool. That's going. All right. We have predestination here. I'm just going to skip it. We'll talk about that now. Let's talk about 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. no one. Who is he like bringing to mind here? Satan. Satan, right? Verse 33 is key to this. Who should bring any charges against God's elect? Right, God's cho chosen ones, his holy ones. Is he talking about like a prosecuting attorney? Like the local DA? That's what he's talking about? No. He's talking about the devil standing in God's court and saying, this person sinned in order to keep you out of heaven. He's like, there's nobody who can do that because you're in Christ. Your sins have been washed away. There's nobody to accuse you before God. Nobody can condemn you because of what Christ Jesus has done. Satan ain't got nothing on you anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I once heard it said that 
if you know when you're confronted when you're feeling guilty about your sins, right? So you remember a sin that you did like six years ago, or in junior high school, or whatever it is. It comes back in your mind or whatever, okay. and you can say to the devil in those moments, "What of it? Okay, <laughs> what of it? I've been forgiven. Jesus has taken that away." Okay. Um, then Paul asks a whole bunch of rhetorical questions, <laughs> right? Uh, what can separate us from love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing can. Okay, let's go on. 36 to 39, we'll finish up here. As it's written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long, and regarded the sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how are these verses comforting as we face this new year? Because nothing's going to separate us from God. Not, not COVID, not, not mandates or lockdowns, nothing. Inflation, war with Russia, Olympics, none of that is going to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So then what does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Verse 37, right? We are more than conquerors. What does that mean? Conquerors plus. <laughs> <laughs> Conquerors Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. What, what does it mean? He won the war, or Jesus won the war, and he gets the prize. Yeah, so conquerors, conquerors imply there was a fight. <laughs> this is not a fight. Jesus is completely and totally victorious over it. Saying that he is a conqueror doesn't do justice to the amount of his total victory. <laughs> it's more than just conquering that, that Jesus has. And because of Christ, we too will have that. Because we're united with him. Um, okay. Last thoughts here. And there's 38. There's a couple of things that he specifically mentions. I'm going to write it down on the board because I want to. Rulers, angels, powers. Okay? What are you talking about? The devil. Great letters. Who is the ruler of the world? God. The devil. God's king. We, oh. we, get, we get all that. Right? So Jesus is taken, right? This is a temptation thing. The devil comes to <coughs> form and says, shows him all the glory of all the nations. Like, I will give you all of this. How? Okay. Angels? Are angel angels going to be fighting against us? No. So it'll be the bad angels. The powers? The powers. The powers that be. He has no power. He has no power over us. Not to say he has no power. And so he's being super extra clear that you get the idea here that the devil will not accuse you before God because he can't. The devil's lost the battle already. He has no power over you at all. And yet he still fights. The gerbil of revelation. <laughs> Best visual ever. <laughs> you weren't here for revelation. In revelation we talk about how the beast um, was captured, the great, the great dragon was captured at the end, and it's bound in chains and cast into the abyss, which is the devil being destroyed in the last day. And so, you know, it could be this big, epic, you know, blockbuster. No, no, it's not a big blockbuster movie thing. It's more like, you know, God takes a little gerbil, binds it in chains, and it's kind of, poof. Because <laughs> nothing has any power compared to God. Okay? All right. We'll end here. Next week, we'll pick up the next chapter, you know, probably. Um, any last questions about today? All right, otherwise we'll see you for Bible study on Wednesday as we continue our Woke World Bible study, which is going pretty well. Um, let's close with the word of prayer. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day and this chance to study your word. Lord, I ask that you would comfort us with the Spirit, and that you would use his, his groanings to interpret our words for us, and that you would give us what we need. Even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.